Lord, the people praise you. Lift you up and raise you. Lift you up and praise you. Justin Gerhardt. I'm so excited about being with you guys next month for your men's retreat. We're going to spend some time together uh, talking about being poet, warrior, kings, looking to David of David and Goliath fame uh, for insight on how expression, opposition, power, and priority can all come together to make us men who are more like God, uh, men who are more like David, and men who, in all honesty, are more like the men we were created to be. Uh, I'm excited about that part of the retreat, but there also will be, I hear, uh, a ropes course, tomahawk throwing, I think, hiking, fishing, shooting, probably lots of uh, scratching, and uh, time with your brothers. And so that's just going to be great. It all uh, happens on September 22nd. Friday evening goes through September 24th, Sunday morning. And uh, it all is going down at The Vision, which is a brand new retreat facility in Huntsville. Uh, if you can't make it out for the whole thing, come on out and make it for as much as you possibly can. Uh, the whole thing costs $40. You can sign up today, uh, next week at the latest, out in the lobby. The forms are out there. Or if you want, you can go online, www.twickenham.org slash index dash php, uh, no, index.php slash men dash s dash r-e-t-r-e-a-t. And if for some reason you can't remember that address, uh, you can just go to the homepage and find the link there. Between now and then, I'm going to be praying for you, and uh, I would love it if you would pray for me. We can all pray that God does some great stuff this weekend, and I believe that he is going to do exactly that. I will see you on September the 24th.
One of the reasons that Justin is eminently qualified to come and speak to us is because he's bald. <laughs> he has a beard. Those are the only people we bring in. So, <laughs> hey, if you're a guest at Twickenham this morning, welcome. We are glad to have you. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. Um, there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place that in the collection plate a little bit later on when it passes. And if you have a prayer request, please indicate that on your card, and we'll be happy to pray for whatever you ask us to pray for. If you're looking for a church home, let's talk. We are looking for new family members. We'd love to hear what God's doing in your life. We can talk about what God's doing in our church and how those two journeys can come together. Just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. One of our traditions here at Twickenham is uh, praying for our new babies. And so we've got a new one here this morning. Uh, Justin and Mary Ashley Littell are here, and big sister Finley, and they are uh, welcoming this morning Jack. He's wide awake, so you can give him a big hand. That's all right. <laughs> Dan Beasley is uh, one of our shepherds. Dan's going to pray for this family here, so let's all pray together. Holly, Holly, Hallelujah. All the glory is due you. You are the Holy One. Holy Father, we come in your presence. Just so thankful for Jack, for his life, the healthy baby that he is right now. Uh, dear God, hear the power of this name, the beautiful, beautiful, strong name that he's been given, and make him a strong, powerful person for your kingdom, for your good. Bless um, Justin and Mary Ashley as his parents. Just give them your Holy Spirit to work through them to just raise this child to be all that you dream of him, all that you want for him to be. And his sister Finley, help her father to be there for him and him to be there for her. Bless, bless this family as a unit. Knit them together as you want family to be, dear God. And as a church, help us surrounding them right now to be there for them, to be the church, the body you want us to be for them and help them to be that for us. Even Jack, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Lincoln, why don't you guys come on up? And uh, one of the things that, I, that occurred to me while, while we were thinking about the baby is that um, I just thought, he's so innocent and pure, and I'm not. Uh, and yet God, who is holy, can make me and you holy, just like that little one. Can we take a second? Let's greet each other with a hug and a handshake, and then we're going to sing about God's holiness this morning. Glad you're here. Thank 
that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Would you be seated as we take our offering and continue our singing on holiness this morning? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our soul shall rise to Thee. to 
pray. Holy God, you are holy, and we acknowledge that how far above you than you are over us. And we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the time to gather here together. And we are so thankful for the sacrifice of your son and how his blood has washed us clean and how much that we need that. Help us to remember that this week and help us to focus on that now as we pass the juice and we take, take it. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Hosanna, you're my king. Hosanna, you're my king. I worship and I see. I worship and I see. I lift to holy name. I lift to holy name. Upon high. I worship and Prince of Peace. 
will reign forever. He is ancient of days. He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. He's my Savior, Messiah, Redeemer and Friend. He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. You are holy. You are holy. And you are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. saying really good today. Really good. So, you know what's cool? I, I really love being a part of a church where Wednesday night I got to, I got to sit in on an awesome instrumental time of praise, and then Sunday mornings I get to sit in on an awesome a cappella time of praise. It's really, really cool uh, that we can be a both-hand church. That's neat. So, Wednesday night, by the way, we're going to meet again the last uh, uh, in this series, Wednesday night, uh, having the spring in the middle of the week, the midweek spring, our instrumental service, a great time of praise. And I've heard a rumor. I don't know if this is true or not. The rumor is Steel City Pops are back. <laughs> That's the rumor. So don't know for sure. Don't hold me to it. Could be. I do know that after service today, uh, Amy Smith, our children's minister, is going to be tearing down the children's set that, that they've used all summer long. It's been a, a, a gorgeous uh, sort of beach environment ambiance for the kids to go into, and they're going to be tearing that down. So if you got a few minutes after service today, why don't you go down to the gym, kind of help tear that down, unless you're the parent of a teen because you're having lunch today downstairs with the gendrons. So, or you can help after lunch, yes, <laughs> until lunch starts, <laughs> Okay, hey, Isaiah chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, if you have a hard copy Bible, let it fall open to the middle. That'll be Psalms. And then flip the pages to the left, and in a few books, you'll be in Isaiah chapter 6 is where we'll be. But before we go there, I, I have to tell you a story that gives you the background for what happens in Isaiah chapter 6. And that story is in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. So again, let your Bible fall to the middle, that'll be Psalms, and then turn the few pages to the left, and you'll wind up in 2 Chronicles, which sounds about as, as interesting as an actuarial convention, right? Uh, but trust me, this is a good story, and frighteningly relevant, and you got to know it in order to understand really what's going on in Isaiah chapter 6. So in the time... When Israel was divided, and this is the Second Chronicles 26 setup story, 
In the time when Israel was divided, a man named Amaziah was king of Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel was to the north, Judah was to the south. And while he did okay as a human being and as a leader most of the time, he did not end well. He spent the last 15 years of his life in exile. And when he died, his son Uzziah took the throne at 16 years old, which sounds really cool to be king of your country at 16 until you realize what a mess he inherited from his father. But uh, 2 Chronicles 26 verse 4 says that Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So good news. But the end of verse 5 hints at trouble to come. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. It's the as long as he sought the Lord part that kind of gives you pause, that maybe there's going to be a but down the road. Success came very early for Uzziah. Uh, He defeated the Philistines. That was the country to the west of Judah. Uh, The Arabs, the Meonites, the Ammonites, these were countries that sort of surrounded them to the east and the south. Defeated all those in battle. His fame spread all the way down to Egypt. He rebuilt Jerusalem's walls. He made the city's fortifications a lot stronger. He improved the infrastructure dramatically, virtually eradicated unemployment, recruited an army of over 300,000 and equipped them with advanced weaponry. His Department of Defense and Civilian Contractors developed machines that could, I'm not kidding you, this is in there. Their defense contractors developed machines that could rain arrows and hurl stones down on uh, the enemy. Everything was going swimmingly for Uzziah. And then the not so unexpected but comes in verse 16. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. Told you it was relevant. One of the dangers of being good at many things is falling for the lie that you are qualified to do all the things. And so Uzziah decided that he was a much better worship leader than the priests they had on staff. And so he went into the temple one day to perform his own do-it-yourself worship service. And what he intended to do was to burn Um, incense on the altar, which was a religious rite permitted only to priests who had descended from Aaron, Moses' brother. That doesn't sound like a big deal to us, right? I mean, because we pray to God ourselves and we come into worship ourselves and it doesn't sound like a, a, a big hairy thing for us, but 81 priests followed him into the temple and said, you can't do this. This is, mm, don't, we're, we're saying, don't do this. Please stop. And Uzziah's standing there at the altar. He's got the censer in one hand, and he's got a match in the other, and he's ready to officiate his own liturgy, and, and the, the priests are standing there confronting him, and he just goes into a rage. He just rages at the priests, and, and he's yelling at the priests, and then all of a sudden, The terrible disease of leprosy broke out on his forehead, which just is a lesson, don't rage at the clergy. That's just a (laughs) takeaway. One quick takeaway. Just trying to love you with the truth here, okay? Love you with the truth. So when the priests saw the lesions boil up on, on Uzziah's head, they hurried him out of the temple. And verse 20 is hilarious. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave. (laughs) It's kind of funny. So verse 21 offers the epitaph to Uzziah's reign. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and excluded from the temple of the Lord. He never got to go back in. Well, this sermon is not about Uzziah. It's not about leprosy. It's not about the minutia of ancient uh, Israelite worship taboos. But it is about God and separateness and exclusivity. So now we're ready for Isaiah chapter 6, where you will immediately see why you needed to know that story about King Uzziah. In the year 
that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. High and exalted, says Isaiah, seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, before we hear verse 5, which recounts Isaiah's reaction to seeing the Lord in his exalted state, remember King Uzziah. All he did was enter the temple with the intention of burning a little incense, which he never actually burned. He didn't actually commit the the crime. He just thought about committing the crime, lost his temper with the clergy, and then all of a sudden he develops a serious case of forehead leprosy. And then years later he dies, and in the year he dies, Isaiah the prophet sees this vision and hears his response in verse 5, woe to me. I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. If I'm Isaiah, I'm doing a quick forehead check here, right? King Uzziah got into trouble just for thinking about usurping the authority of the priests. Isaiah actually sees God, and he thinks he's about to die. Well, that raises some questions. This whole passage raises some interesting questions. Let's start with one that may or may not have been of interest to you, the seraphim. I'm kind of interested in them. What are they? And what, what, what do they do? And why are they surrounding God? A lot of what we know about the seraphim comes from this passage right here. They appear to be a very high order of angels. And uh, we learn just by reading the passage that they can hear and they can speak and they can fly. We learn that they have faces, feet, hands, and wings. What's curious is that they have six wings. And they fly with two of them. So if you can fly with two wings, why do they need six? Isaiah says that they use two of their wings to cover their faces and two to cover their feet. Apparently, they hide behind the other four wings. He says they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. They are repeating this mantra about God to each other, and they're speaking these words in a volume sufficient to shake the temple to its foundations. I'll tell you what I think. I think they use the wings not to hide themselves, but, but, but to hide from God. I think they're, they're trying, they're, they're hiding from the holiness of God. I think that's what's going on. That helps explain Isaiah's terrified reaction, Right? I mean, what what we have here in Isaiah is the response of a sensitive but sinful human being who has an encounter with the holiness of God. The seraphim are constantly doing this because of God's blazing holiness. Isaiah sees it without the benefit of six wings, and he's ruined by it. So that raises another question. What what do we mean when we say that God is holy? What, What is that? The word holy is used as a prefix for God more than any other prefix or attribute in the Bible. This one element among the many attributes of God overshadows all of the others. Here in Isaiah and in the book of Revelation, we read that God is holy, holy, holy. We've sung this morning that God is holy, holy, holy holy. But we never read and we never sing that God is compassionate, 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 or infinite, 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 or gracious times three, or kind times three, or that he loves, loves, loves. We don't, we don't read those things. They're all true. But when we talk about the holiness of God, we're talking about something very special, very unique, something that is especially God. And the main idea when we're talking about holiness is God's separateness, his otherness, his one-of-a-kindness. He's the one who stands apart from all creation. A.W. Tozer wrote a number of books on the holiness of God, and 
he said that to be holy means to con- not, that, that God does not conform to a standard, that God is the standard. To be holy means that God is complete and completely perfect. He needs no other to complete him or to fulfill him. You can also think about it in terms of, a lot of us work in the medical profession here, right? You can think about it in terms of health. Uh, To say that God is holy uh, is, is to mean that God is completely spiritually healthy. Evil, if evil is moral sickness, then holy is pure and perfect moral health. God is completely morally and spiritually healthy. There's no division in God. There's no lack. There's no absence in his character. He is perfect. Holiness is the absolute absence of any evil. It means that God always acts consistently with his character. I believe in honesty. I do. I think it's always right to tell the truth. I believe it's always right to be honest, even if it hurts you to be honest. That's my firm conviction. That's my firm belief. I will tell you that I do not always live honestly. I will tell you that I do not always tell the truth. I believe humility is, is the only appropriate position for a sinful human being. I believe in humility. I believe humility is, is how every one of us ought to live. But my family, my friends, and my colleagues at work will tell you that I do not always behave humbly. There is a gap between my beliefs and my behaviors. Do you see that in you? Am I, am I the only one? I know some of you. No, I'm not the only one. (laughs) With God, there is no gap. There is no tension. There is no difference. God always behaves consistently with his character. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, John said said, said that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's how John put it. So what's the appropriate response when a human being who has those gaps, who is not perfect, what's the appropriate response when a human being encounters the holy God? Two things occurred to Isaiah with crystal clarity. He was immediately convicted with a sense of his own sinfulness and the sinfulness of the people he lived with. That's what he means when he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. He's not talking about bad oral hygiene. He's talking about spiritual bankruptcy. We are corrupted, is what he was saying. God's immaculate purity, God's stunning perfection, God's overwhelming righteousness are not just greater by degree than Isaiah's, they are totally other. Now, here's the if you uh, were an athlete in high school or college, uh, or even if if you're an athlete right now, you can probably relate to this example. I, I like to play golf. I'm not great at golf, I'm not awful at golf, I'm kind of average at golf, right? I really enjoy playing golf. I have been to professional tournaments and watched professional golfers play golf. They don't play the same game I play. It's a different game. Whatever they play, that's not what I play. I bet those of you who played football have watched professional football players play a different game. Baseball, a different game. Tennis, a diff, totally different game. Even professional bowlers, right? A different game. The difference between how I play golf and how Jordan Spieth plays golf does not even approximate the, the difference between my holiness and God's, between your holiness and God's between Isaiah's holiness and God's. A molecule and Mount Everest don't even get that math right. And Isaiah was not a bad guy. I'll just, I'm going to go, this could hurt your feelings. Isaiah was better than you are. Isaiah's better than I, I am. He was a prophet in Israel, arguably Israel's greatest prophet. He is quoted more often in the New Testament than any other Old Testament prophet. His wife was a prophet. There is not a single negative reference anywhere in Scripture about Isaiah or that that, that calls into question Isaiah's integrity. He was an extraordinary man, and yet in the presence of God's holiness, 
All he could say was, I am ruined. I am ruined. You don't, you don't hear that kind of personal assessment much these days. Generally, we think we're pretty good. Uh, and just to be real honest, self-righteousness, self-righteousness is making a real comeback these days. A Lifeway research poll recently found that 32% of nuns, those are people that claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. They have no, they're nuns, no religious affiliation. 32% of them don't even believe that sin is a thing. 8% of Americans who do believe that sin is a thing think they don't have any. So one in eight people, or eight out of 100 people think they're sinless. And then uh, 74% of Americans said that small sins really shouldn't be judged by God. I don't know what they call small sins, but I'm sure that telling a lie would be considered a small sin by most people. In his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges described what he called cultural holiness. He said, we adapt to the character and standards and behaviors of the people around us. And as long as we are better than they are, at least the way we perceive it, we feel like we're good to go. We play a game. We play the what about game. That's where we admit we have a flaw, a failing, an imperfection, and then we minimize it by pointing out that somebody else has a bigger flaw, a more fatal failing, or a more glaring imperfection. This morning, I stopped off to get some cash before I came to church. And there was a couple uh, in line ahead of me at the ATM. And they were wearing shorts and hiking boots and hats. And I thought to myself, self, they're not going to church this morning. And you are. See, I'm not the best Christian in the world, but what about those people who don't go to church? As a husband or as a wife, I got my faults, but what about the flaming fiasco that is my wife or my husband? I will admit that sometimes I can be a little prejudiced sometimes, you know, but what about those people who call for violence? What about BLM or Antifa or the alt-right? or the white supremacists. There's a whole lot of what about ism going on right now. Listen, you can make hell's angels look like the little sisters of mercy if you compare them to a low enough standard. So let's stop. We, if we settle, when, when we settle for good behavior, we learn to live with the unholiness so long that we begin to look at it as normal, natural. Yeah, politicians are gonna lie and given to self-interest and merchants are going to cheat and friends are going to fail us and so we'll make a few laws here and there to protect us and that'll be good. Isaiah's encounter with his holy God convicted him of his own sin and the sinfulness of his culture and all he could do was cry out, I am ruined. Being an Israelite didn't help. Being a prophet didn't fix it. Being a good man didn't measure up. In the presence of this holy God, good enough isn't. That's when something very important happens in Isaiah. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is atoned for, and your, uh, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. God is not satisfied with good enough. You may be, I may be. We may play the what about game. God's not satisfied with that. God will not be satisfied until we are holy too, like he is holy. Isaiah gives us this vision of a God who is infinitely holy, separated, unique, one of a kind, yet he is not willing to live with the chasm between us and him. God is not interested in protecting his holiness. He wants to share it, and he wants it shared. The way I see it, God had two choices. Deny his own holiness in order to have a relationship with us or give us his holiness that, so that we could have a relationship with him. And the first option just wasn't tenable. To deny his holiness, to water it down, to walk away from it, to embrace good enough would have been to divest himself 
of his very godness. So God chose instead to share his holiness. He shared it with Isaiah, and he's offered to share it with you and me. Through the death of Jesus on the cross, through his burial and resurrection, God has opened a way. And if you and I will put our hope in, stake our lives on what God did through Jesus on the cross, not through anything that we do, not through uh, any kind of self-achieved righteousness, if we will if we will put our hope and trust in the righteousness that God makes available to us through Jesus on the cross, God will credit the perfection of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus to our account. We don't deserve it, but God will do that for us. And then when we ratify that decision through verbally confessing our allegiance to Jesus and submitting to the rite of baptism, God fills us with his Holy Spirit and then we too are holy. And once we accept that gift, look at what happens in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go? And I said, here am I, send me. The only response to a holy God is to fall on our knees and cry, I am ruined. And the only response to a God who shares his holiness to save us is to share it with others, to say, here am I, send me. When I have a prayer with you, keep your seats. We're going to sing a song here in just a second, but let's pray together right now. Holy Father, we sing sometimes about how we, we want to see you high and lifted up, and then we read a story like this one, and we're going, well, hmm, maybe not. Because in your blazing, indescribable holiness, we are not holy without Jesus and yet through him we can see your holiness and live to tell about it so thank you for loving us so much that you found a way to make it possible for sinful human beings to become holy and to have a relationship with you help us to live out the reality of what you have given us. Help us be holy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Help us to go and tell others what is available. Thank you for being a holy God and for making us holy people. In Jesus' name, amen. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we cry. Twick. Just like every Sunday, Jody, it's always great here. Amen? We're really glad that you were here this morning. Just a couple of things as we close. As Jody mentioned, and it's not a rumor, there will be Steel City Pops on Wednesday night. So I expect to see all 275 of you back just like you were two weeks ago. All right? Deal? Steel City Pops around. Um, also, uh, parents of our youth group, don't forget that you have a catered lunch meeting today as soon as we finish. And we hope that all the parents can stay and enjoy that informational time with our new youth ministry team. And while I'm talking about youth ministry, let me mention something else. We don't always recognize every volunteer for every act of service that takes place. But occasionally, some people go above and beyond um, any expectations that a volunteer might have. And we have had that occasion in recent months, and we just thought it was appropriate uh, that we mention that to you. We had our youth ministry team leave way back in early April, and we did not get a new youth ministry team until uh, just into July, August. And so in that transition, one of our couples just stepped up 
and ran the program. I mean, they planned, they executed, they traveled, they hosted, they ran the whole thing. Full-time youth ministers as volunteers. So I'm going to ask Emily and Brad Bass. Come on. Did Brad make it back? He didn't make He said he would be here. <laughs> Emily Bass. This is ridiculous. Thank you. Ridiculous. Thank you. All right. Hey, it's been a great morning. Before we close, a quick word from our shepherds, and then we'll close in prayer. Todd White with that word this morning. Good morning. Jody, thank you uh, for a great reminder this morning. What a great time of worship together. Back in June, we started a process to begin to look at the possibility of adding some additional elders or shepherds, as we call them here, um, to our current set of nine elders. And I want to give you a status update of, of where we are and kind of how that process has unfolded, if you'll permit me to do that, and then I'll, I'll close this out in prayer in just a minute. I guess the first question as we started this, just by way of background and reminder, is why would we go about a process of trying to add additional shepherds or looking at the possibility of adding additional shepherds? Is it nine enough? It may have been a question, and that's something Jody addressed when he did a couple of lessons on leadership back a few months ago as we kind of started to begin to work into this process. And, and I guess the reason we wanted to step out and to begin to look at that is that as an eldership, as a group of shepherds, um, we are trying to focus less on the executive and the administrative functions of being a leadership team and a lot more on the aspect of shepherding, of being involved individually in the lives of the people that are under our care. And we believe that's what Scripture calls us to do and what God calls us to do. If you are in an executive role, a smaller group is generally a little more palatable because when you get in those board meetings, it's a whole lot easier to make decisions. But if you want to try to be about shepherding and to try to be out among the people, really we felt like we should at least consider the possibility that we may need more to better serve the needs of the church here. And so we began to look at that. As we did, we prayed earnestly before we began this. And we asked you to pray along with us, and you did, as we started into this process to begin to look at whether God would have us to do that right now. And so we asked for God's guiding, guidance through this, for his blessing through this, and ultimately that God's will would be done in this process. And so we joined in that together. Speaking of the process, uh, what exactly did we do? Well, back in 2015, about two years ago, we added six additional elders to the five that we had at that time to bring us up to 11. The process that we used at that time seemed to work pretty well, and so we started there, and we began with a very similar approach, and the core of that was to encourage all of you, the members here at Twickenham, to participate actively by nominating men for consideration, and so you did that. Two years ago, each of our new elders that we added received at least 10 nominations from the church at large, and so... We decided at that point as we began the process that we would establish that as a minimum number of nominations to be received to proceed forward in the process of meeting with the current elders and, and then presenting those names back to you. Once that entire process was refined, we communicated that to the church, we put out the forms that would be used, and then you began to work through that process and we prayed through that together as we went through it. So what was the result? Well, while we had a number of well-qualified and godly men who were nominated through this process, and we are thankful to God for that, each of them either felt like this time was not the right time for them to step into that responsibility, or they did not receive the minimum number of nominations that we had established in the process to move forward. So now what do we do? So we met as a leadership team, as a group of shepherds. This is not something we expected. And so how do we handle that? Let me give you some insight into what we discussed 
as a group. And, and here are some things that we, that we uh, talked about together. First is that both as a church and a group of shepherds, we all prayed earnestly that God would guide us through this process. We prayed before we started. We prayed through the process that God would lead us, and we trusted God to do that. And so having done that, we just felt it would be inappropriate for us to alter the process midstream when the results didn't come back quite as we had expected. And frankly, we just felt it would be disingenuous having prayed beforehand, having asked you to join us in prayer, having laid out the process and described it, to then go back and, and try to manipulate that process to get to a different result, even if it's something that we thought we wanted from the beginning. We just felt like that would be disingenuous. And so instead, what we believe to be the best course of action at this point is to accept that result that it is not in God's timing for us to add additional shepherds to our group right now. And so we're good with that, and we're ready to move forward. So what do we do now? We, we would ask you to do a, a few things as we, as we come out of this process. The first is we would encourage you, all of us, to continue in prayer, that we would just be a people that continue to seek God's will in everything that we do. We, we want to do that in our individual lives. We want that to be our practice, and we want to do that as a body of believers. And so we just ask you to continue to do that as we move forward, that we would just trust God to lead us where he wants us to go. We also ask that we all continue to take care of one another. We, we do believe that for nine shepherds, it's a big task to take care of a lot of people. One of the things I'm thankful for, though, is that we have a church that responds. You help one another. We help each other here as a part of the Twickenham family. We would encourage you to continue to do that. When somebody's sick, let's see to their needs. When somebody needs help, let's respond as God would have us to do that, be an extension of his grace. Let's just continue to do that together. We would ask you to pray for the current elders. We need wisdom, we need discernment, we need God's grace, and we would ask you to pray that God would continue to give that to us. And we would also ask you to pray for those that we still believe God is preparing, although this is not the time. We know there are godly men in this church who are on a road of preparation that will, we think, eventually step into the role of a shepherd. Would you be in prayer? that God would continue to prepare them, and that at his timing, they would step into that role. We just ask you to join us in doing that. Probably next year, we will reevaluate where we are. We want to continue to be in prayer to seek God's guidance, and we're going to do that. And then probably next year, we'll relook to see if we think that it would be right to enter back into this process and to continue in it. I want to say thank you on behalf of the shepherds for your participation in this. It, it didn't go as we expected, but we're not discouraged by that. We hope you aren't. We just trust God to lead us through this. And so we're going to go forward with the leadership team that we have right now. We're going to trust God's timing, and we would ask that you do that along with us. Would you stand, and, and let's, uh, let's pray together as we're dismissed. Father, you, uh, you are holy. You are holy, and what a great reminder this morning uh, that you're not like us. You're not at all like us. You're so far above us. You, you are separate. You are different. You are set apart. And Father, uh, before you, uh, we are undone, and yet because of your mercy and your grace and your plan, you made a way through your son Jesus, for us to be holy as you are holy. And so we're just so grateful for that. We say thank you. Father, we thank you um, that you have walked with us through this process as we've looked at our, at our leaders here. Um, this didn't go as we expected, and yet we trust you. We trust your timing. And so I do pray that you will continue to bless us as a church family as we just try to do your will 
and to wait on you and to be faithful, Father, to what you call us to. I do pray for those who were nominated in this process, uh, godly men who I think will be servants in this capacity at some point, but Father, in your timing. And so we pray that you would continue to prepare the hearts of future leaders in this church. And Father, this morning as as we dismiss, uh, our hearts go to the people that are on the Texas coast today. Um, There is a lot of devastation and there will be a lot more to come. I just pray for those who are displaced, those whose homes have been destroyed. I pray for those who are responding and helping, and I pray that you would open our hearts to do what we can in our community to extend your grace to those who need it. Father, thank you. Thank you for being our God and for saving us, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.